<laughs> right, so um, today's speaker is uh, Fiona McFarlane um, from the University of St. Andrews. Um, so Fiona holds a BSc from the University of Dundee and um, then did a PhD um, at the University of St. Andrews in mathematical biology. And um, she is now a postdoc in St. Andrews, also working in this area, mathematical biology. And the topic for today is on the screen, discrete and continuum methods to investigate pattern formation in growing cell populations. So the screen is yours. And thank you for the kind invitation to talk as well. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on some work that we've been doing over the past couple of years on modeling cell populations with applications in pattern formation. So I'll give a little bit of a biological background of some of the things that we want to investigate with our models. And then we'll start to look at the modeling framework itself, um, focusing on one case of chemotaxis. And then if we've got time, we'll maybe look at a few other cases that we've applied the models to, looking at um, cases where cells are responding to pressure and cases where cells are responding to um, Turing patterns. So to begin with, we want to think about the types of patterns that we might see arise in cell populations. Um, so patterns arise in a wide variety of contexts in biology. So for example, we have these um, vegetation patterns. Um, we also have patterns in shells, for example, or on the coats of animals. Today's talk, we're going to mainly be focusing about um, patterns in cell populations, so more looking at a cellular and tissue level scale. So that could be things like cell sheets, um, looking at invasion in cancer, for example, or more complex patterns in things like embryogenesis. So when we're starting to build these models, we need to have a think about the mechanisms that may play a role in how these patterns form in cell populations. So some of these mechanisms may include um, things like diffusion of chemicals. So that's the spreading of molecules uh, in space. Could include things like chemotaxis. So that's movement dependent on some chemical gradient um, where chemo attraction would be towards the higher concentration of some um, chemical, for example. So biologically, that could be things like cells responding to some nutrient or things like chemorepulsion where um, cells, for example, would move to an area of lower concentration. As well as chemotaxis, we could consider things like haptotaxis, which is movement dependent on the density of some substrate. So um, on a cellular level, that could be things like cells moving on an extracellular matrix where the movement of the cells is directed in some way by the tissue that they're in. We could also um, consider other forms of cell migration um, that might lead to patterning, for example, random motion or other more complex forms of cell motion. As well as motion, we could think about things like cell mechanics that might lead to patterning. So that could be adhesion of cells where they're kind of um, stuck together, repulsion of cells where they're and wanting to move away from each other, and more complex things like deformation of cells or pressure where cells are um, affecting those around them physically. Another uh, mechanism that might lead to patterning would be things like spatial heterogeneity within a cell population. So that could be things like mutations or different prol proliferative ability of cells um, or things like cell division or cell death that could lead to these complex patterns forming in the cell population. So just to give an idea of some of um, the, what these look like, these mechanisms look like in um, biology, I've got a few uh, examples and hopefully the videos will run. So that's an example of chemotaxis where there's these um, bacterial cells in a Petri dish and we're pipetting in some um, nutrient or cyclic AMP more specifically, and the cells start to move towards this source. And we see that when we change the uh, position of this source as well, the cells nearby will go to this nearer source, but there's still some going to the original source. So this is a good example of this chemotaxis process where the cells are detecting this gradient 
um, of the nutrient and moving towards it. An example of something like adhesion would be collective cell migration. So this is a nice video of, um, let me just run that again, of a cell sheet moving where each cell um, is contributing to the movement, but the population as a whole uh, we see moves almost as one organism. An example where we might see patterning caused by cell division or mutations would be in things like cancer. So we have um, on the very left panel here, a normal epithelium. Um, so everything's very well structured. There's these defined layers between the epithelium and the connected tissue below. And the cells within the epithelium themselves are very well organized. Whereas in things like cancer on the very right hand panel, um, where we might see mutations or increased cell division or increased um, production of growth factors, for example, we see things become very disorganized and we get this invasion into the tissue below. So with these um, types of patterns that we see in biological cell populations, what do we want to do with our models? We want to be able to um, try and investigate some of these patterns that seem to arise from single cell dynamics where we see these patterns start to emerge at the tissue level scale or the whole population scale. So before we go on to the framework, we need to have a think about what types of models we want to use um, to investigate these processes. So apologies if this is very basic for some people, but I just want to give a uh, an idea of what kinds of models we want to look at in this um, for this talk. So one thing we need to decide is if we want to look at a discrete model or a continuous model. So a discrete model is where we have information only at certain points, for example, on a spatial domain, um, whereas a continuous model or a continuous function allows us to look at the value at any point um, over a certain interval. So as well as deciding if we want to look at discrete or continuous models, we need to think whether we want to look at deterministic or stochastic models. And for the context of today's talk, deterministic is gonna represent models where there's no randomness. Um, and if you put in the same input into a deterministic model, you will always get the exact same output. Whereas the stochastic model allows for some level of randomness. So if we, re if we run the simulation more than once, for example, we might get slightly different results. And generally when we're looking at cell population models, a deterministic model will give us some smooth output, whereas a stochastic model, things might have a little bit more randomness in the output of the model. So thinking about these different types of models, we can look at what kind of models have been used to look at cell populations before. So PDEs or partial differential equations is a common approach to modeling cell populations where these partial differential equations are continuous and deterministic. These contain one or more functions of several independent variables and the derivatives of those functions and allow us to track the change in a function with respect to these variables. So in the context of cell populations, for example, we could track cell density over time um, and space. So these models are useful for tissue level dynamics and whole populations. Some other benefits and limitations of these types of models um, are that PDEs are amenable to further analysis. So we can look at different analytical techniques um, or mathematical methods to investigate these systems further without having to do simulations. When we are looking at the numerical simulations for these models, they're generally computationally inexpensive and we can easily model large numbers of cells or molecules quite easily. However, some of the limitations of these models is that they're deterministic generally, so it's not easy to add that randomness that we might be looking for into these models. Uh, we also can't look at single cell features um, because we're generally looking at the whole population or a subset of the population rather than each individual cell. So moving on to look at another type of modeling approach would be to look at agent based models or individual based models. So these are generally computationally based um, and these are discrete models where we're looking generally um, on a lattice, for example, 
we were only looking at cells at specific positions in space or on time. And we can add in randomness to these models as well, as we'll see. So within these models, we can consider each cell individually and these cells will react and interact according to a set of rules where these rules are probability based. Um, so for the ones that we're going to look at today, these are going to be based on a grid and each rule that the cell follows is going to be based on some probability of the cell undergoing that mechanism. And these are useful for looking at single cell or cellular level dynamics. So some of the benefits and limitations of these is that they can be modified and compartmentalized quite easily. So we can um, separate parts of the system in these computational models. We can quite easily adapt to things like non-standard or evolving domains. So things like growing domains, um, where it's a little bit more complex in the PDE setting is generally a little bit easier with these agent-based models. We can add in randomness or stochasticity. And we can look at single cell features or heterogeneity within um, the population. However, these models are not amenable to analysis techniques that the PDEs are. And the numerics can be computationally expensive, especially uh, when we're looking at large numbers of cells. And this can, this can lead to longer run times or complexity within the simulations. Uh, so another approach would also be to look at hybrid models. So that's where we could use multiple types of model within um, the framework itself. So for example, um, we could look at agent-based models to describe the cell interactions that are a little bit more random, or we want to investigate the single cell dynamics and then use PDEs to describe more continuous processes like um, oxygen or nutrients or chemicals in general. One other thing that we're also going to look at for this talk is we're going to be comparing the stochastic and deterministic models. So the agent-based models and the PDE models um, of the same system. And that allows us to do analysis of the system with the PDE model, but also look at the single cell level dynamics with the agent-based model. And one way that we can do that is by deriving the continuum limit of the agent-based models, um, which will give us PDEs in the context of today's talk. So as I said before, what we want to do is develop frameworks that allow us to investigate collective cell patterns arising from single cell dynamics. So these mechanisms we want to look at um, are coming from interactions of single cells, but then we'll look at how this affects the whole population. So we're going to start out with agent-based models, but as I said, we're going to look also at the continuum counterparts of these models to investigate the systems a bit further. So to give an idea of the framework, we're going to look at one specific case, which is going to be a scenario where we're looking at chemotaxis within a cell population. So in this scenario, what we're going to consider is we're going to consider that we have some cell population denoted by N. And the cells within this population are going to be able to undergo two forms of cell movement. They're going to be able to undergo um, density dependent random movement, uh, where this density dependent means that the cells are going to be restricted if there's already a lot of cells in the area they, they want to move to. So to um, what we're doing here is we're enforcing some sort of limit on how many cells can be in any one space. As well as this more random movement, we're going to look at chemotactic cell movement, um, which is going to depend on the gradient of some chemical, and we're going to make that a chemoattractant uh, denoted by C. We're not going to look at cell division and cell death in this scenario. Um, we're just going to focus on cell movement for this part. And because we've got this chemical, we also need to include um, the processes of this chemical. So this chemoattractant is going to be produced by cells, is going to decay, and will also diffuse in our spatial domain. So let's look at how we set up this individual-based model. Um, so we'll look at the two-dimensional setup, but this can also be done in 1D or higher dimensions as well. 
So for the 2D setup, we're going to be focusing on a lattice-based, uh, agent-based model. So we're going to split up our spatial domain into these boxes, where each box is going to have the same width, delta x, and the same height, delta y. Then when we include our cells into this computational simulation, we're going to restrict the cells to be within one of these boxes on the lattice. The then the cells are going to be able to undergo different mechanisms based on their position within the lattice. So for the more random cell movement, um, we're going to have some probability of each cell at each time step uh, of moving to each of the four neighboring positions shown on the diagram. And these probabilities are going to be dependent um, on cell density, like I said before. So we take these um, four probabilities to be defined uh, as shown here, where the psi function is a function of cell density at the position the cell wants to move to. And we choose this, fu uh, this function such that when there's a maximum value n bar, this is zero. So what this means is that they'll become a point where there's too many cells in the spatial position and no more cells can move into that space because there's no physical space for them to go into. With these probabilities as well, we also have um, some inherent probability of moving at all, which is given by theta. And here we take this over four, um, just because we've got these four different positions. So that if um, there's no cells in any of these positions, there would be an equal probability of moving to any of the four neighboring positions. So with the chemotaxis process, again, we're going to have some probability of moving to the four neighboring positions, but this time we're going to have some dependence on our chemical C. So this time the four probabilities are going to be defined by this equation here. So this eta, this blue um, eta, is some intrinsic sensitivity of the cells within the population to the chemical gradient. Um, so this is some parameter that we can play with and it determines how likely the cells are to interact with the chemical gradient. This psi function is the same one that we've seen before. So this is again, just to stop um, there being any movement into positions that are already full of cells. And this last term is a term that depends on our chemical. Where here, what we're doing is we're taking the difference between the concentration of the chemical at the position we want to move to and the position that we're currently at. And we take the positive part of this difference to ensure that cells are only going to be moving to areas that have a higher concentration of the chemical. So what we're doing here is we're enforcing that it's a chemoattractant, that cells um, are wanting to move to areas that have a higher, yeah, higher value of C. Um, here we have to divide by some C max, so this is some local maximum concentration. And the reason we have to do this is just to ensure that all of these probabilities are between zero and one. So we've got our cell mechanisms. We also need to think a little bit about how we define our chemical concentrations on the lattice. And as I said before, with um, agent-based models, things can become quite slow if you've got a large number of molecules. So with this chemical, we're not necessarily interested in each molecule of the chemical, but we're more interested in the local concentration of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a deterministic approach um, more based on PDEs for our chemical. So on each position on the lattice, we're going to have the local concentration of the chemical. And then the chemical um, or chemoattractant is going to be produced by the cells on each position. Um, and there's going to be some production rate alpha C where that chemical is then produced by the cells. We're also going to have diffusion of our chemoattractant um, so the chemical can spread between um, neighboring positions at some rate at uh, theta C. And we're going to have some decay of our chemical as well at the rate theta C. So that just means that that position, there's going to be a decrease in the amount of chemical. So as I said before, it might be useful to look at the um, continuum limit of these individual base models or agent based models as well to be able to do some analysis. 
So the way that we do that is we can write down the um, form of the individual base model by looking at the underlying random walk of the cells within the population. So this is what the underlying random walk looks like in 1D. Um, don't worry too much about the technical detail for this, but these are all terms that we've seen before. So for our cell population at the time step K plus one, the change in that population is going to depend on what the population was before. The cells moving in and out from random motion um, where this is based on these probabilities that we saw before and the cells moving in and out from chemotaxis, where again, these terms are all based on the probabilities from the previous slides. We can also write out a form for chemical um, where we have this diffusive like movement, production by the cells and natural decay of the chemical. So I'm not gonna go into detail about how we do this, but we can look at the continuum limit of this by taking approximations of these equations and letting our time step and our space step to zero in such a way that allows us to rewrite these as a system of nonlinear partial differential equations. So when we do this for this case, our cell population equation becomes this PDE, where we have density dependent movement and this density dependent chemotaxis. And for our chemical, we have this reaction diffusion equation where we have the standard diffusion, production and decay of the chemical. So for those who are familiar with equations for chemotaxis, these are a form of the patlack keller siegel model with volume filling effects. So what's quite nice is from these um, probability-based rules from this individual-based model, we're able to formally derive these well-known PDEs that have been used in this area before. So we've got these two forms of the model and we want to then look perhaps at some numerical simulations for this and start to compare some of these models and start to think about what kind of questions we can ask with these models. <coughs> so as an example, some of the questions we might want to think about are do we observe um, patterning or organization of the cells at the individual cell level? Um, and do we get a good match between the agent-based model and the continuum at PDE models. So this is an example of some cases uh, in 1D where our top panel is going to be the cell density um, results and the bottom row of panels is chemical concentration. Each column is going to be a different time step. So we're starting at time equal to one in column A and then up to time equals 500 in column E. And in each of the plots, the solid colored line is the individual based model results. Um, and the dashed black line is the corresponding PDE results. So we're gonna focus on the cell density. So we start out with an almost uniform cell density and we see that over time, these peaks start to form of cell density. Um, and we see that these peaks then start to merge. So that these two peaks here then become this one peak in this case and these two peaks here become this one peak in this case. And then panels D and E are essentially the same. So we get this um, stabilization of the pattern. So we get a stable pattern forming in the cell density. So we get this self-organization um, of the cell population where they're producing this gradient and then following this gradient in a way that leads to these peaks of cell density. We can also see in this case, we get a, a good agreement between the individual base model, the solid lines and the PDE model, which is a dashed line at each of the time steps. So in this case, the PDE is able to capture the results of the agent based model. I'm sorry, what I should have said as well is the agent based model results that are shown are the average of five runs of the simulation. But in this case, the runs of the simulation are quite robust that we get very similar results for each case. So this is a 1D example of some of the results we can get. We can also look at 2D. Um, so now we're just looking at cell density. On this top row, we've got the cell density from the individual base model. Um, so X1 and X2 are our two spatial dimensions. And then the cell density is given by the color 
where dark blue is zero and up to yellow, which is a high cell density. The bottom row is the corresponding PDE model. And we have the three different time steps and then the same time step in panel D, but just rotated. So if we compare the cell densities, we see that um, to start with, we have these four peaks of cell density. And then in both cases and both models, we get this kind of joining of these four peaks to form this one peak in the center of the domain. And what's nice is when we rotate this, we see this flat top on the cell density peak, which kind of, uh, which highlights the effects of that volume filling that we included. So we limited the number of cells on the position um, so that's why we get that flat top in this case. So in the 2D setting, there is slightly um, more difference between the individual base model and the PDE model, but qualitatively, the results are very similar in this case. Um, so there's a little bit of difference in panel B. So an actual question would then be, are there gonna be situations where the individual base model or the agent based model and the continuum limit of that model don't match. Um, so we can look at one example where we see that in this case. So this time, um, again, we've got cell density on the top row and chemical concentration on the bottom row, but this time each of the four columns is a different parameter setting. Where the difference between these settings is the initial number of cells on each position. So in the first case, we've got 10 to the five cells on each spatial position at the start, and then in going down to uh, column D, where we have 10 to the two cells on each position at the start of simulations. So as before, the solid dark colored line is the average of the agent-based model and the dashed black line is the PDE model. Um, in this case as well, uh, what we can see here, these paler lines are each run of the individual base model. So starting with case A, we have um, this second peak is quite a good match between the individual base model and the PDE model, but there's a little bit more randomness in this first peak. Whereas when we go further down, we see there's more and more randomness in the individual base model where we don't get a stable pattern forming. And um, this is fairly stochastic. Whereas the PDE, we still get these two peaks forming no matter the initial cell density that we choose. So in this case, what we're highlighting here is that there can be cases, especially when there's more randomness in the system, where the partial differential equation model is not capturing the same um, things that the individual base model is, where the individual base model is able to capture the dynamics that are occurring from the single cell level a bit more. So I want to move on to look at a few other cases, but some other things that we've done with this chemotaxis model is looked um, at the linear stability analysis of the PDE model. Um, we've looked at the cases where we have very high cell densities um, to investigate that volume filling effect a bit more and looked at what the effect of chemotactic sensitivity has on the patterns. So if we change the sensitivity of the cells to the chemotaxis, we get different numbers of peaks, for example, in our pattern. We've also looked um, at the limit of when the volume filling function goes to one. So that's where we're essentially saying that there's no volume filling effect. And again, that's convergence to the classical patlack kaler siegel model. Um, and we've looked at that in the individual base model and the PDE case. And in those cases, we see blow up of the population. So to move on um, to another case, just to give some examples of the kinds of patterns we can look at with this framework, we're going to focus on a case of cellular pressure instead. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're considering that we have two cell populations, M and N, this time. So we're going to have two interacting populations. And both of these populations then are going to contribute to some cellular pressure, which is a function of total cell density. So as before, in the previous case, the cells were producing the gradient of the chemical. In this case, they're going to be producing, um, essentially producing the gradient of the pressure. But this time the cells are going to be moving down the gradient of pressure. Um, so they're going to want to move away from high density areas. 
So this is another way of implementing that kind of volume filling effect where cells are maybe not as likely to move to areas where there's lots of other cells. In this case, we are going to include cell division and cell death, and this is also going to be dependent on some um, function of the cellular pressure. So as an example um, of these mechanisms, we're going to have this cell division, which is going to have some probability um, in the individual base model, dependent on some pressure function. Cell death is going to be related also to that pressure function. Um, and then we're going to have movement of the cells responding to some gradient in the pressure where the cells can move right or left um, or not move at all. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about how we set this up because the methods are very similar to the previous case. But as before, what we can do is we can write out the random walk of the individual base model. So for this time, we've got um, equations for the population N and the population M, which are very similar, just with different mobility parameters or division and death terms. And again, these terms are very similar to the ones we saw in the cubotaxis case, but instead of moving in response to some chemical gradient, we've got now the gradient in the pressure um, instead. And again, we have some local Pmax to ensure that these probabilities are between zero and one. So as before, we can take the continuum limit of these equations and in this case, we get PDEs of this form here, where we have this um, movement in response to the gradient of the pressure, which is this uh, derivative of P term. Then we have the growth terms as well for both population. For the simulations I'm going to show, what we're going to do is we're going to consider that one population doesn't um, grow, but just responds to the pressure and movement. So what that could represent biologically would be a system where perhaps one population is in homeostasis. So that means our growth and death terms are balancing each other out. So it's a fairly stable population. And then the other population that does grow is something where it's not a stable population. So that could represent, for example, cancer cells um, and normal tissue cells, where the cancer cells would be the ones that are growing. <clears throat> So to give an idea of some of the results we can get with this model, we're going to look at some 1D simulation results. Um, so in this case, we've chosen the pressure function to be a power law function of the total cell density. And in the simulation results we're going to show, we've got pressure in this left-hand plot, which the individual base model is this solid gray line, and the corresponding PDE is the dashed black line on top. And then on the right hand panel, we've got population N in red and population M in blue. So a reminder, population N is the invasive population and population M is the more stable population. And the parameter setting that I'm showing, we're going to look at a case where population N is more sensitive to this pressure gradient um, in how they move. So we can run the video in this case. And we see that the um, population N grew quite quickly. Um, and then we see this mixing of the two populations in this space here. And then population N moves on throughout the domain in a kind of traveling wave-like pattern. Population M kind of stayed where it was and didn't really move much in this particular case. We, uh, for the individual base model and the PDE model, again, there's a good qualitative and quantitative match between the two in this case. But what's interesting is if we switch these two mobility parameters and make it that the um, invasive population is less sensitive to the uh, pressure gradient, we get something different. So this time when we run the simulations, we see that we don't get mixing of the two populations, but instead we get this spatial segregation where the um, stable population is essentially pushed along by the invasive population throughout the spatial domain. Um, we have started to look at this in the 2D setting. So this is just the cell density of the invasive population uh, four different time steps for the two alternating um, parameter settings. 
where we get either radial growth of the invasive population into the stable population um, area, or we get this finger-like pattern um, as the population develops. So this finger-like pattern was the case where we expected mixing of the two populations, and this radial growth was the spatial segregation case. So this is something that we're still working on um, and investigating in a bit more detail. Some other things we've done with this pressure model is looked at um, other cases where the agent-based model and the PDE don't match, where there's a bit more randomness. We've done the um, traveling wave analysis on the PDE models, and we've looked at a few cases where we just have one population. We've also looked at what happens if we have slightly different pressure functions. And something else that we're working on at the moment is looking at cases where we have a phenotype structure in the populations where the cells within the population might have slightly different movement um, or growth probabilities. So to finish up with, I just want to look at one final scenario um, that we've applied the model to. And that's looking at um, cell populations responding to some cheering patterns. So in this case, we have two chemical populations, U and V, which interact via Turing mechanisms. So they, they are going to interact in a way that results in Turing patterns. And what we want to do with this is then put a cell population N on top of that and allow this cell population to respond to these um, underlying patterns of the chemicals U and V. So one thing we want to think about is do the mechanisms by which the cells respond to this pattern affect what type of patterns we see or the kind of structure of the patterns that we see. So we're going to look at two cases within this scenario. <coughs> we're going to look at a case where the cells are responding to the chemicals via chemotaxis. So very similar to what we saw in the first example I showed where the cells are going to be responding to the chemical gradient. Um, and they're going to be responding to a chemical U. Or we could also look at another case, which is going to be the proliferation case, where instead of the cells responding via chemotaxis to the chemicals, we're going to be looking that the um, cells will respond via their division or proliferation. So that could represent a case where it's something like a growth factor, where areas of high concentration of the chemical, the cells are more likely to divide. So I'm not going to go through the details of this, but we, um, as before, we've got the underlying um, individual based model and the underlying random walk, and then we can do the same um, derivation to the PDEs. But again, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but if you are interested, then I can send you those details later. Just an example of some of the results we can get for this system. Um, we're going to look at a 2D case. So in this uh, first column, we're going to have the concentration of the chemical U and the chemical V. So that X and Y are two spatial dimensions, and then the concentration will be given by the color, where blue is low concentration and red is high concentration. We're then going to compare um, our case where the cells are responding to the chemicals through their proliferation for the individual base model in this top panel and the corresponding PDE in the bottom panel. And then similarly, the chemotaxis case on the right-hand side and the corresponding PDE below that. So we'll run those simulations. And um, it was very quick, but what we can see there is in the chemical, um, as expected, we get these target-like Turing pattern shapes um, arising. But the way that we see the cells responding to this chemical does depend on which mechanism we chose. So for the individual base model and the PDE model for the proliferation case, we get these very fat spots um, of cell density. So we lose some of that definition of the target shape that we see in the um, underlying pattern. Whereas in the chemotaxis case, we get very small target spots and we get these very concentrated peaks of high cell density. In, this case, in these cases, we get a good match between the individual base model and the PDE model. Um, and for all of these cases, the pattern stabilizes. So we get these stable patterns over time. What we can also do with um, this model or this framework 
is we can also look at cases where we have growing domains. So um, I'll show you some results with that, where we consider uh, uniform growth to start with. So we're assuming that starting from this position here, we're going to allow the domain, uh, the spatial domain to grow uniformly at all positions over time. So when we run the simulations um, for that case, we get this splitting of the underlying pattern. So we get these very small target spots over time, but we also see this splitting in the corresponding individual base model results uh, and the PD model results for both cases. For the chemotaxis case, we see that things are a little bit more stochastic in the individual base model, um, whereas we get these very, still very defined spots in the PDE case, we kind of lose some of the definition in the individual base model. We've also looked at other ways that the domain could grow, so things like apical growth. So um, for that, what is happening is the domain is just growing at one corner of the spatial domain, um, the top right corner. So with that case, again, sorry, these were quite fast, these videos, uh, everything was splitting from this top corner, so stretching and then splitting. And again, we get these smaller spots of pattern um, and we get generally quite good matches between the individual base model and the PD model. Again, with these cases, we see a little bit more randomness in the individual base model. So again, I've not had time to show you cases from that um, simulation where we looked at cases where the agent-based model and the PDE model didn't match. So that was things where there was low cell density or cases where cell death was closer to cell division, um, which leads to a bit more randomness. I also didn't show the equations for the growing domain cases. Um, I said a little bit more complex, but again, if you are interested in that, then you can take a look at the paper. So just to kind of recap on um, what we've talked about with this modeling framework, where we have these individual based models that are probability based, where we're able to derive the PDE model. From the agent-based model side or the individual-based model side, we can easily modify these to more complex scenarios. Deriving the PDE formally allows us to do these different analysis things, so like linear stability analysis or traveling wave analysis. We can also um, then say that in cases where the PDE does match the individual-based model or in cases where we don't have as much randomness, then um, the PDE would maybe be better to use on its own just to improve the computational speed. Whereas in cases where we have a bit more randomness, the individual base model may be better to use just to capture those dynamics that are happening at the single cell level. One other benefit of using the agent based models and doing this formal derivation is sometimes agent based models are a bit easier to describe to non mathematicians. Whereas when we do that derivation, then we can just use the PDEs, but we can say where each of these terms come from, depending on those simple rules of the individual base model. So all of this was work done with collaborators, um, Federica Buba, who's uh, sadly no longer with us, Mark Chaplin from St Andrews, and Tommaso Lorenzi, who's in uh, Torino. And if you are interested in any of the work that I've talked about today, you can find more details about each scenario in these three different papers, or feel free to ask any questions. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you um, for this very nice talk. Um, as usual, I, um, I first invite the, um, the PhD students or, or indeed master students to ask a question if any student has a question. This doesn't. Oh, come on. There must be somebody. No. Well, okay, then anybody who would like to ask a question or to make a comment. Can you ask a question? Sure, sure, go ahead, go ahead. Um, could you give a rule in when the PDA, PDE approximation will give the correct result or <coughs> side with the discrete? Is there in a sharp rule on, on the correspondence or not correspondence between the two approaches? Um, we've not looked at that in detail, although that is something we want to do. Um, there's obviously cases where the formal derivation breaks down. Um, but we've not looked at it in great detail to have specific uh, 
uh, like you say, rules of when it will work and when it won't work. It's generally more just looking at the numerics and just um, looking at cases where we expect to get a bit more randomness in the individual base model. So we've not done that formally yet, um, but that is something we hope to do in future. Any it's other? Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry, sorry. No, 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 I just wanted to, 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 see, to say that Miguel is trying to, to ask some questions. Ah, He's yes, I see. But uh, the microphone is not working, so. Well, put it, put it in the chat. The, the yeah, put it in the, put your question in the chat, then I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, well, ah, okay. So the question is, perhaps I missed something. But what is the origin in the asymmetry of peaks in the first patterns you showed? Mm. Uh, in the PDEs. <coughs> I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'm trying to work out what you mean by that. So we we um, so we're not seeing your slides anymore. Just, oh, you know, yeah. Uh, Sorry. <coughs> in the first patterns you showed, it says that's what it says in the question. <laughs> we'll go back to those patterns. I think maybe here. Yeah, maybe the I, I guess maybe these. Yes. So, um. I mean, this was just one run of the simulation. If we do different parameter settings, we get different numbers of peaks. Um, but with the, the results, we do get these initial peaks that then destabilize and then form the stable peaks. Um, but again, it just it does depend a little bit on initial condition. Um, in this case, we chose a totally uniform initial condition. And then um, just because of the parameter setting, we end up with these two peaks in this case. But if we change some of the parameters, the number and position of the peaks does uh, change a little bit as well. So this is the agent-based model, right? I guess, no? Uh, so the agent-based model is that... and the PDE are both um, give the same results in this case. So, but but if, so if I see this correctly, then in the, like, Panel A is kind of the earlier the earlier time, right? But I don't know whether the initial condition was sort of symmetric with respect to X going into one minus X. Um, so that's probably to do with the boundary condition. The initial condition was totally uniform. This is oh. one time step off of the initial condition. Um, so this is probably coming from the boundary condition that the cells right. are pushed in. in. But, 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 but if the initial condition is completely um, um, flat, then why so i e there's a left there's a symmetry between x and one minus x right and then yeah. in the pde where there's no randomness how can the symmetry then be broken at a later point i think that's uh, the question that's the question I think. yeah i mean that's a good question so in an in the agent-based model i can see that right because the randomness doesn't need to respect that symmetry but in the pde the... i think there is like um Unless yeah, I think I would need to double check the details of that. Um, okay. I think there is slight differences in the kind of number in the sides of the peaks, so they are slightly more. They're not totally symmetric. The peaks, um, so they are more likely to kind of merge uh, in this case, for example, and not stabilize. Whereas here, they are more symmetric, so that's why they stabilize. Okay. Anybody else with a question or comment? Or... So, I mean, I had one. So I think, so going from the agent-based model to the PDE, I mean, my understanding, that's my, is a question, whether I understand it correctly, right? There's kind of two, you, you sort of assume two things, right? That A, there are basically many particles in each box, right? That allows you, and they each behave randomly, but you basically calculate the mean behavior. So that eliminates the randomness. And then you take a continuum limit, right? Yes. But they are in principle, these are in principle two independent, uh, I mean, two independent procedures in a way, right? I, is yeah. that right? 
so one so, could sorry yeah yeah so the pde is kind of an approximation of an approximation Mm -hmm. of the agent -based model. so i.e when when there's a discrepancy between the pde and the agent-based model it could that could be due to either one of these two things or yeah i guess right mm. yeah that's true and then that I was thinking, I mean, there's a, a sort of intermediate thing between the agent-based model and the, the PDE, right? Like an, 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 a, a stochastic partial differential equation. So one could derive, I think, also systematically something like that, right? That would capture at least some of the randomness. Yeah, I don't know whether that is something that you have considered or that would help or... Yeah, I mean, the stochastic PDEs would be something to look at. I mean, I'm not really familiar with them, mm -hmm. in depth, um, but yeah, it definitely would be something to consider. So that, that, that's another thing one could do, I think. Anybody else with any comments or questions? Or... No? Well, okay, then we thank you again. Yep. It's, um, um, so I, this is a bit sort of now it's a bit strange just to switch off, but then, well, that's well, that's what we can do. Um, right. So thank you again. Uh, bye bye, everybody. Thanks and, for the invitation. Uh, bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao.